As you may already know, my name's Claire Baker and I'm a former clutterholic and borderline hoarder. I successfully cleared all my clutter over 20 years ago without the need for an expensive home visit. And I've been helping people around the world do exactly the same ever since so that they too can know what it's like to live a clutter-free life forever. I like to share my experiences both before and after I cleared my clutter to help fellow clutterholics and hoarders and their friends and family by illustrating some of the thoughts, feelings, and experience that I had, it helps others to understand their experiences when we struggle with clutter. What I share is not intended to be a judgment or criticism of anyone I mention, although I understand some people will take it that way. I share my experiences and perspective, which is a reflection from which I can share my learning with others who may have similar experiences. From the age of nine until my early 20s, I struggled with my health. I had glandular fever, which then morphed into ME, myelagic encephalomyelitis, also called chronic fatigue syndrome. It was the 1980s, and it was a new condition that was little understood. In the UK, a well-known TV presenter, Esther Ranson, had a daughter who also had ME. ME isn't a condition that can be cured. It's a condition that is managed. The most common symptoms are extreme tiredness, problems sleeping, problems thinking and concentrating, poor memory, headaches, flu-like symptoms, muscle and joint pain. I had them all. My mother was constantly on the phone to our doctor and he couldn't find any cause for my symptoms. I think this is a case of school phobia, Mrs Draper, he told my mother. I was eventually diagnosed with glandular fever, which had no definitive test at that time. I was taken to a private doctor in London to see if complementary medicine might be able to be help with the symptoms. He diagnosed this new condition, ME. I was immediately put on multiple mineral supplements, vitamin C, various different vitamin Ds, other very specific vitamins and minerals that you couldn't buy on the high street back then. I did half days at school and no physical education classes because of the symptoms. My mother would pick me up at lunchtime on the days that I went into school. My friends stopped lending me their school books or notes so that I could catch up on what I had missed because they didn't know if they'd get their book or notes back the following day. Such was the unpredictability of my school attendance. The headmistress of my junior school called my parents into her office one day to advise them that they should start looking for an alternative school for me because I was unlikely to pass the 11 plus exam to get into the senior school. She was wrong. I passed and got accepted despite my poor attendance record. Somehow, and even now I don't know how, I managed to be a bit of a star in the school swimming team and I did well in the school tennis team. The irony was I rarely turned up for the team practices due to my health. Yet on the day of the swim meet or tennis match, I would turn up, win, then return to bed to recover for a day or two. I even swam a couple of times for the county swim team and had the potential to make it to Wimbledon. This pattern of managing my ME through days off, consultations, daily mineral supplements and rest continued for another five years until my 16 plus exams, at which point I was ready for a change. My parents and I looked around for other schools and I was offered a place at a boys boarding school in Oxford that only took a few girls for the two years of the sixth form. They even said that my place wasn't conditional on my 16 plus exam results, given the poor prediction by my headmistress. I was now focused on my goal of proving everyone wrong and getting good exam results. I maximized my revision on the good days because I never knew whether tomorrow would be a bad day or not. I had weekly vitamin and B12 drips at the London clinic of my specialist consultant to help with my energy, memory and concentration. A letter was written to and accepted by the exam board to give me extra time in my exams because of my energy, memory and concentration issues relating to my condition. 
Despite all expectations, I achieved all A and B grades in my 16 plus exams and took great pleasure in waving my headmistress goodbye on my last day. My home environment and the dysfunctionality of our family meant I was impatient to go to my new boarding school. The school was supportive and understanding of my health issues, kind and compassionate, and I thrived. Boys were so much less complicated than the all-girls school I'd been at for the previous 10 years. <laughs> for the first time in my life, I made firm friends. I thrived on the independence, and without even noticing it, my health started to improve. I still had days when I was exhausted, but overall the frequency of bad days and tough weeks reduced. Two years after having weekly drips to get through my 16 plus exams, I didn't need the same for my 18 plus A-level exams. My condition had improved and there was no explanation as to why. The only thing that had changed was my environment and support network. By the time I left my Oxford boarding school, I was well enough to go on my gap year adventure to Guyana, South America, without any supplements. By the time I returned, five months later, ready to go to university, my ME symptoms had all but disappeared. As the ME symptoms subsided, I started to develop a new problem with my lower back. I was sent to a Harley Street physiotherapist and had every test and x-ray under the sun. They didn't find anything to warrant the extremes of pain and immobility that I experienced periodic periodically. I had to wear a back brace to get me through the particularly bad days. The curious thing was that when I cleared my clutter and created the life timeline, I realized what was going on. It suddenly started to make sense. I could see a pattern in my life timeline of triggers in relation to my health. When I felt unsupported, unappreciated, unheard and unloved, my physical health deteriorated, so much so that I now look back on my ME and believe that it was actually a physical expression of growing up in a family that didn't do emotion. I now strongly believe my ME was actually childhood depression. I believe that's why when I moved schools, the symptoms improved. I believe that as I got older and I had more life experiences, emotional highs and lows, emotional stress started to express itself in my lower back issues because I didn't know how to deal with emotions. As a therapist once commented, it's interesting that you describe your lower back pain as making you feel vulnerable, while at the same time, you describe feeling rejected emotionally vulnerable and unable to express or verbalize your feelings. Don't you just hate it when people say things that trigger light bulb moments about things you've struggled to understand for years? <laughs> yeah, I'm so glad that she shared that observation with me because it became a significant turning point for me. My life timeline shows the evidence of what she described. I can literally see the triggers and patterns weaving their way through my life timeline. Yet, despite this new awareness, I've had to accept that I can't always control or eliminate the triggers. In the weeks leading up to my wedding in Cyprus in 2006, and for months after, I was on crutches with my back brace alongside multiple pain relief injections costing £1,000, $1,200 each, all because of the emotional trauma that I was experiencing because of my parents' refusal to come to my wedding. Since 2016, I've found that regularly practicing my TRE, trauma release exercise, enables me to manage my back by ensuring any small traumas, feelings and vulnerabilities don't bottle up and trigger an episode. I listen to my back carefully. It was an essential tool to cope with my emotions when my brother died in October 2022. I was doing TRE two or three times a day to begin with, then once a day, then twice a week, all to help me process the emotions and avoid an acute episode with my lower back. I'm so glad I learned so much from my life timeline. I'm glad I now know that when I feel lower back pain, it's a coping mechanism that I ignore at my peril. If you're on your clutter clearing journey and you're struggling with ongoing 
ongoing or periods of poor health. Use your life timeline to see whether there may be triggers that impact your health in a negative way. It won't necessarily enable you to stop your health challenges, but perhaps like me, it will help you become aware of what makes it worse so you can find ways to avoid or minimize those triggers.